Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you that we get to still celebrate the resurrection and the belief that binds this community together. Lord, as we study 1 Peter through this season of Easter, help us to see the impact that that message that you have raised your son from the dead has on our daily living. And today, especially as we look at what it means to be purified in you. Through Jesus, your son, we pray. Amen. So I need a little uh, congregation participation here. Uh, it's a uh, question I'm going to ask. It comes out of a movie. Be grateful I'm not going to sing this. And there's some people like Pastor Jeffrey who can do that, and I, I really would la- rather you not laugh, that, but that you answer the question. So if there's trouble in the neighborhood, who are you going to call? Thank you, thank you, Ghostbusters. <laughs> thank you, Ara. <laughs> uh, Ghostbusters, why? Well, something's wrong, right? You got ghosts and everybody's going to call Ghostbusters. Well, I didn't call on Ghostbusters, but I did call out one day when I was a kid. Um, and there was nobody there to hear me <laughs> when I called out. So we had, uh, across the street from us, the homes across the street from us, uh, had a slough behind them when I was growing up. And we, I spent a lot of time down at that, that slough fishing, and, and a friend of mine had a boat, that uh, rowboat that we had, and we'd go out on that slough. Uh, we never ate any of the fish for good reason out of that little pond, but we, I, I, I did kill a number of bluegill. Uh, one day, we, this friend and I got in his boat, and and we were out uh, rowing away, and, and what made this day special was that we had had a, a lot of rain, surprise, surprise, for Oregon, right? Um, and the, whenever it got to a certain level, uh, the, the, most of the time this pond would just stay uh, self-contained, but when it filled up a few feet, it would spill over into other ponds, which would create a current, okay? And so we got into his boat, and we were rowing around, and we went to the north end of the pond, is where the water was flowing out into another pond. And, and the current was a little too strong for us to be able to row back to the dock. And he was bigger than I was. And, and so we tied up the boat to a small little tree. And uh, he went out to get help and, and splashed through. I don't know how deep the water was at that time. It probably seemed to me as fairly deep. But he uh, didn't come back. <laughs> Yeah, at least that's my memory of it. <laughs> and this pond, there were no homes around it where we were at. And calling out at that time wouldn't have meant a, a, a great deal. Uh, so I finally panicked. Cause it's not surprising. Probably only about two minutes. Um, <laughs> and I, I got out of the boat. And I'm not a swimmer. And I got out of the boat and walked that current to the shore. My mom was really mad when I got home. I don't think it was because she was afraid something happened to me. I think it was because she had to wash my clothes. Uh, <laughs> but who are you going to call? <laughs> Very good. Uh, Peter deals with calling today, doesn't he? First, first verse. If you call on him as father who judges impartially. Rather interesting way that Peter says this. He says it in a way to engage the community that's going to hear this and eventually going to read this text, okay? That's what we do the same thing. You know, he could have said, and I don't kind of, the NIV translates it this way, and it doesn't, it's not as engaging. We're using, using a, a statement, if, you know, uh, this is, uh, if it's true, now engages the reader, because they're going to answer the question. If you call on him, as Father who judges impartially. And the readers are going to go, of course we call on Him. And He's got His readers, He's got His listeners right where He wants them. And then He goes on to talk about, doesn't He? If you go back in the First Peter text, He talks about conducting our lives with fear. Did that strike you as kind of odd? Conduct your lives with fear. Live your lives with fear. So let's talk for a second about what that fear looks like. What is he talking about? When the fear of what? Of course, we're talking about fear of God here. Why would we fear God? Two levels. 
And the fear here meaning worship, right? Falling down on our knees and, and worshiping God. Why would we do that? Well, first of all, this God that you and I worship is so far beyond your ability and my ability to comprehend. Think about your body for a second. How intricately woven together your body is from the, from the cells and how just doing this is an amazing feat. This is the God who created you, but not just you, the entirety of that universe who takes delight in supernovas, who delights in black holes, all for His glory. This God that's so beyond anything that you and I can in this pea brain think of. This is the God we worship, but it is also the God we worship who knows us intimately, who makes Himself known to us, right? That's what the season of Easter is all about. This God has made himself known to you in his son, Jesus Christ. A God that we can be known because he becomes human. And to conduct our lives in fear is not to be afraid of God, but to be awestruck who this God is that we worship. So as we dig into 1 Peter here today, we want to talk about this issue of being purified. That's the theme of, the, of, of our, our time together today and what it means to be purified. If we're going to conduct our lives in fear, what does it mean? So first of all, conducting our lives in fear means that we hold on to a God who has purified us in Christ so that we might believe in His power to raise Him from the dead. Let's go back to the text. 1 Peter chapter 1. We're skipping a few verses from last week. We're picking up at verse 17. So let's look at verses 17 through 21. In your pew Bibles, it's on page 1014. Page 1014. If you'd like to follow along there, if you brought your Bibles along, we hope you'd encourage, encourage you to turn there. Uh, and also, if you have your the scriptures on a phone or other electronic device, uh, we encourage you to follow along. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 17, And if you call on him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are, being, are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. So, it's um, been a long time since I've been to Elitches, thank goodness. A long time. I think a lot of last time was a youth, gather, a youth outing, uh, that I went there uh, back when my body could still handle it. I think I'd go back to Elitches and hang out at the water park. That'd be fine. But those, I don't need to get sick. <laughs> and it seems like every ride at Elitches would make me sick. But the last time I went, I think it was the last time I went, anyway, I, I actually rode the Tower of Doom. I've done this once, and that's all I'll ever do it. You know, so if you don't know what the Tower of Doom is, if you drive... Uh, Driving on I-25, you go through Denver, it's that big, tall tower, it's 200 foot in the air. Um, yeah, and it's good. you're sitting four or five people across, or whatever it is. And I was given some really good advice when I wrote it. It said, when you, when you go up, just keep looking way out in the distance. Just look way out in the horizon. Don't take your off, eyes off the horizon. When you drop, it'll seem like you're not dropping at all. It actually worked. But I don't need to do that again. <laughs> Why would I even write it? Because I believe. This is talking about faith believing, because I believe that those who constructed it, constructed it in such a way that it would safely deliver me to the ground, and it did. But I had to be in that seat. I had to ride the, the ride to actually have faith in it. And faith that we're talking about here, faith in, in, in our God who has raised Jesus from the dead, is being in that seat, trusting God with our life, and trusting Him to to redeem us from uh, uh, our feudal lifestyle. What that feudal lifestyle look like? This is what Paul talks about. He talks about our feudal lifestyle. And I'm sure for you that feudal lifestyle looks a little different maybe than it does the person sitting next to you. Uh, but maybe that feudal lifestyle was that, 
that lifestyle that said you got to get ahead. You got to get somewhere. You got to be uh, whatever. I don't even know what that means sometimes. What does it mean to get ahead? It, it sounds good, but we tried whatever it meant for us. We tried to get ahead and we found out it wasn't working for us in our life. Another one you and I hear about, and maybe we've tried uh, for ourselves, a lifestyle that, that tries to find inner peace as if it depends on me to find that inner peace. It's what I do to find some inner peace. Or maybe even using Christianity as a way just to find inner peace, if that's the goal of Christianity, is inner peace. And we found out that doesn't work either. And that was just kind of a futile lifestyle. Or maybe that, that futile lifestyle for us was reaching out to the stars, reaching for the stars. It's another one of those phrases. I try to figure out, what does it mean? I mean, it sounds so great, so magical, right? Reaching for the stars. And you've tried that, and, and it didn't work. So believing in God is a different kind of lifestyle. and It begins by being purified. As Peter talks about it, we've been purified. Purified not with the futile things of this world, the things that perish, that, that disappear, that we won't take with us when we die. We've been purified, washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. His death is still our death, and His blood is still what purifies us and makes us clean. That's what's purified us. To believe then in this God who has the power to raise Jesus from the dead. It's wonderful, isn't it, that we still continue to have these butterflies in the sanctuary? I mean, you can't escape it when you come in here now on Sundays of Easter to say, He has risen! And these butterflies remind us that we're in that season of Easter and that we believe in a God who has raised Jesus from the dead and has given us new life. We believe. This conducting our lives with fear means we hold on to God who has purified us in Christ so we believe in that power of the resurrection to go with us in our daily life. That's not all. Secondly, we conduct our lives with fear as we hold on to this God who has... Um, purified us to belong to each other in the bonds of love. So let's go to the, back to our text. Let's look at verse 22. Start at verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God, for all flesh is like grass and all its glory it like the flower of grass, the grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So we're called to belong. Obedience to the truth. Did that catch you again? Obedience to the truth. What does that mean? You see, our faith in Jesus Christ is never a private thing. Our faith in Jesus Christ is always public. I know we weren't raised that way. But the truth is, faith is public because it's always seen in our daily life and how we conduct our life. Faith is always something that is seen. And, and maybe it got a little confusing here in the text. You see, Peter says that we should love each other, we'll get to that in a moment, with a pure heart. And it almost sounds like a pure heart is something we create. It's something we have to do. We have to get ourselves right. We have to get the right motives. We have to do all this to love somebody with a pure heart. Probably would be better for us to translate this as with a cleansed heart. Because a cleansed heart doesn't come from you and me. You and I can't cleanse our hearts. It is what's already been doing, done to us when we talk about being purified. Our hearts have been purified by Jesus Christ. And so with that pure heart already given to us through Christ, we love each other. So let's talk about this bond of love in the Christian community. And I want you to think on this for a bit. What would happen if you and I spent more time loving other people as Christ has loved us rather than wanting to be loved by others as Christ loved us? 
So let's talk a little bit more about that. It seems to me that we human creatures and those of us here in this community want others to love us the way that Christ loves us, that unconditional love, that love that accepts us with all of our faults and failings because we know those faults and failings so well. And so we desire, we want somebody, someone to come into our life who will love us unconditionally. And it seems that that becomes our primary goal. What would happen? What would happen within this community if we set that aside for a a while? It's not that it's wrong, but just set it aside and said, you know what's more important? is I learn to love others. And I try, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, to love others the way Christ loves me, that I learn to love the person sitting next to me in the pew unconditionally, that I learn and I try to give of myself the way Christ gave himself for me. What would change? What would happen? What would happen with our women's ministries here at Holy Cross if if the women tried to love each other in that same way? What would happen with our youth ministry here at Holy Cross if the youth would spend time trying to love others the way Christ loves them instead of being loved? What would happen within our Vacation Bible School ministry team that's, getting, that's forming right now if they, as they work to, to this common goal, if they too would sit there and, and try to love others the way Christ loves us? That's the bond of love. You see, we have been bound together in love. First, we've been bound to God and His love for us, not our love for Him, you hear that so much within the Christian community. It's like what really binds us to God is our love. That's not it at all. Our love can't bind us to God because it's always going to be imperfect. His love binds us to Himself. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And out of that love, yes, we love Him. But His love for us binds us to His heart. You are bound to God today because of that love of God. And in that love binds us to each other. We belong to each other. Even if you don't know the people in the pews next to you around this building today, you're still bound to them in love by God's love for us. So conducting our lives with fear means that we both believe and belong. There's a third aspect to it. It's very important. And I'm going to cheat a little bit here. We're going to go into uh, next week, a little bit of next week's text as well. You see, conducting our lives with fear means that we hold on to God who's purified us in Christ to become what He's called us to be. Let's look at the next two verses in chapter 2. Chapter 2 of 1 Peter, let's look at verses 1 and 2. Peter encourages us, So put away all malice and all deceit, and hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. It's interesting that Peter began our text today in in chapter 1, verse 17, by saying, if you call upon Him as Father who judges impartially, when we have to understand the foundation for that is God's call upon us first. That God has called you and me in the waters of baptism. He's called us to become something. So let's revisit that whole issue of lifestyles we talked about a little bit earlier. He's called us to a different type of a lifestyle. And, and maybe our lifestyle is, is, has been really defined by chapter 2, verse 1, with envy and malice, selfishness, Maybe that has been what defined our lifestyle. But we've been purified in Christ to have a different lifestyle and to let that lifestyle be seen in the world. And it's a lifestyle that sees God. That sees what he, who He is and what He's done in our life. And, and we're becoming those people. God is continuing working in you. He's working in you. I know He is. You know He's working in me to become the people He has called us to be. You know the story of Peter Pan. Uh, Peter Pan believed, right? He believed he could fly, and he flew. Peter Pan belonged. He belonged to the Lost Boys. and In fact, he led the Lost Boys, right? But he never became. He never became an adult. He always remained the child. It's a good thing for us to believe in the power 
that raised Jesus from the dead. It's a good thing to belong to God and to, to each other. But the third aspect is just as important, that we become. That we become the people that God has called us to be. The question that we're dealing with this morning is a very important question. What does it mean to conduct our lives uh, in, in fear as we worship God? The problem is that it's not going to take just um, a 15 to 20 minute sermon to make this happen in our life. It, it, that's, you know, 15 to 20 minutes can't accomplish this power of the resurrection working in us. To believe in the power of the resurrection, to belong to each other, to, to become what God has called us to be is what takes place not just here, strengthened by the meal of the word here, but for you and me it's what's going to happen over the next seven days as we live out our life in the power of the resurrection. It can't just happen in 15 minutes. Amen. Let's stand.